All right. Hey, everybody. I think we're going to get started. All right. Uh, thanks for being here. It's uh, exciting to be here talking about machine learning. We've got a lot of great talks tonight. Uh, my name's Amit. I'm going to just set the stage and talk very briefly about MLlib, what it is, how it started, where it's going, that sort of thing. And then I'll let the main talks commence. OK, so uh, what is MLlib? Uh, as the title says, MLlib is, oops, is Spark's machine learning library. Ah, sorry. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of different machine learning libraries out there. Uh, MLlib, though, has, what is going on here? OK, <laughs> I'm not touching anything. I'll see what happens. Uh, OK, yeah, so MLlib is Spark's machine learning library. It, it's fast and scalable, which is pretty nice. Uh, and another huge benefit of it is that it's part of Spark's ecosystem. Uh, and that, that affords two really nice benefits. One is a simple development environment, uh, but the other is interoperability with Spark's other components. So you don't just get to do machine learning. You can you know, process SQL queries. You can deal with streaming data. You can do graph processing as well. Uh, so MLlib, uh, there, you know, what I'd like to talk about first is just you know, where it started. MLlib is an offshoot of MLbase. So MLbase is an open source project out of the uh, Berkeley AMP Lab. The goal is to simplify the development and uh, and deployment of machine learning pipelines. It, it's built on top of Apache Spark. And the goal of MLbase is really higher level machine learning functionality. I, ooh, sorry. Something, something weird is going on here. All right, sorry. So, yeah, so the goal of MLbase is really to focus on higher level machine learning functionality. In particular, how to, you know, how to create APIs to simplify machine learning development, and also how to auto-tune these machine learning pipelines to sort of simplify the tuning of these hyperparameters. But of course, in order to deal with this higher level functionality, we needed some core machine learning within Spark to deal with. And that led to the development of MLlib. Uh, so yeah, MLlib is Spark's core library. And uh, I mean, the, the MLlib, oh my gosh, I'm really sorry. My computer is just not happy. I don't know what's going on. OK, sorry. So. ML, the MLlib is part of Apache Spark itself, whereas MLopt and MLI are experimental test beds. Uh, and as I'll talk about a little bit later in this talk, some of the ideas from MLlib and MLopt are already starting to make their way into MLlib, which is kind of exciting. And also, Evan Sparks later today will talk about MLopt in more detail, or as he likes to call it, Ghostface. Uh, so you'll, see, you'll hear more about that in a little bit. Uh, so again, MLlib started as an offshoot of MLbase. It, it started you know, as a pretty simple project. It was developed in the AMP lab with 11, 11 or so contributors. It dealt with or worked on Scala and Java. And it was shipped last September with Spark version 0.8. But fast forwarding just 10 months, you know, we've seen an incredible growth in the, in the project. So more than five times as many contributors. We've also added support for, for Python. Uh, and you know, there's a lot, a lot of new functionality in, in the most recent release, version 1.0, as I'll talk about. So, you know, when we started, the algorithms that we supported were basic algorithms for classification, regression, collaborative filtering, clustering, as well as an underlying optimization primitives uh, gradient descent to power the classification and regression algorithms. Moving forward to version 1.0, we've added a bunch of new uh, different algorithms, and also added you know various ways of doing dimensionality reduction. Uh, one of the big things that we added was related to decision trees. So since the original release of MLlib, lots of people have asked for decision trees. They're a very standard uh, algorithm used in practice. They're interpretable. They work very well, or especially ensembles of them work very well in practice. Uh, so you know, we added a, a scalable implementation in MLlib that works both for classification and regression. And Manish, later on tonight, will be telling you about this in more detail. So what else is new in the most recent release? Uh, so first is you know, related to documentation. We've, we've very much improved the user guide, added more code examples and templates to allow you to better play with the code and actually get things up and running quickly. Uh, we've, along with the rest of Spark in version 1.0, we've enforced API stability. 
Uh, and we've also borrowed some ideas from ML Base and from you know, MLI in particular, so related to sparse data support, which is you know, super important given that data is often very sparse. We've also added a notion of local and distributed matrices, so higher level objects that make it easier to reason about machine learning algorithms. And so you know, what's new in the, in the next release? Well, uh, Spark is on three month release cycles. And the cutoff for new features for the next release is actually tomorrow, uh, July 31st. And you know, we have some exciting things that we're adding in, in the next release. So the first is a statistical toolbox to do you know, standard things you might want to do exploring your data. Uh, we've, we're also adding new learning algorithms, including non-negative matrix factorization and uh, multi-class support for decision trees. Uh, another really exciting uh, addition is combining Spark streaming with MLlib to allow for online updating of models. And this is in the form of logistic regression for now, but it, there's plans to, to add more later. Uh, we're also adding some, you know, we also added some optimizations. And here by optimizations, I don't mean that in the mathematical sense, I, just, I mean in the performance sense. Uh, so you know, one is determining automatically whether to broadcast large weight vectors or not. Uh, a new, an improved uh, communication for ALS, which leads to faster performance. You can check out the Databricks blog for, for results there. Uh, we've also added a bunch of other things as well. One thing I'll highlight is the uh, Python API for decision trees. We also might be adding, it's not clear whether or not this will make it in yet, but some notions from MLI related to you know, higher level interfaces, as well as multi-model training, which again, Evan will talk about later today. All right. Uh, so beyond 1.1, what you know, what can you expect out of uh, out of MLlib? So you know, on a high level, the you know the the plan is to include in MLlib scalable implementations of common machine learning algorithms, as well as you know good documentation and use cases for for these different algorithms that we're supporting. We also want to add functionality for higher level uh, pipeline creation. So borrowing ideas in part from MLbase and the ML optimizer. Uh, but you know, de developing feature extractors in a way for people to actually build machine learning pipelines. Uh, but I should, you know, I should add that this is an open source project. The community, to a large extent, you know, determines what features get in and actually creates them as well. So your feedback and contributions are encouraged. You should join the the dev and the user list to let it be known what you're interested in and or what what you're able to to contribute to the to the code base. If you want more information about MLlib, there's a user guide you could check out. You could check out my Spark Summit talk, where I had more time to go into details and show some examples. Uh, and here's, you know, here's a list of all the all the contributors. I don't think I left anyone out, um, but you know, it's it's growing really rapidly, so it's really exciting. All right, so I'm done with my very short overview of MLlib. Before I continue, though, I'd like to make a few Spark-related announcements that some people in the Spark community asked me to make. So one is uh, there's an O'Reilly book about Spark, learning Spark. Uh, and there's a new update. It's still, you know, it's still uh, pre-release, but you can look at the uh, online version, which has been updated recently. Uh, second, so the Spark Summit was last month, and it was very well attended. And you know, we're really eager to understand how people are actually using Spark in practice. So if you have a second, it'd be great if you could check out the Spark survey and fill it in. It's very, it's very short, but it'll give, you know, give more information about how people are actually using it. And you know, you can win prizes. For instance, uh, I think the prize is a free entrance into the Spark Summit in San Francisco or the Bay Area next year. Uh, third announcement is that Scala by the Bay, uh, it's a conference that's happening next week. There's going to be talks about Spark streaming in Spark. So if you're around and interested, you should check it out. Uh, and finally, just to, to reiterate, Spark 1.1, the code freeze starts tomorrow. And after that, community QA starts. So it'd be great if you could follow on the dev list to, you know, to help vote on release candidates. All right, so that's all I have to say. Uh, and you know, we have some exciting talks next. So first, Manish is going to be talking about decision trees. Evan will then talk about Ghostface. And finally, we'll hear about machine learning at Yahoo from Andy. All right, thanks. Let's hope your computer works better than mine did. I hope to.
No. Can you hear me, guys? Okay, so I'm going to be speaking about scalable distributed decision trees in the Spark MLLib library. Um, before doing that, I would like to thank Yahoo for hosting us. It's an amazing venue, good food and beer. Uh, also, this is joint work done with uh, Hiraki Indu Das, who's right next to me over here. Evan Sparks, who's speaking right after me, and Amit Talwarkar, who just spoke before me. The key takeaway is feel free to trouble these guys with decision tree questions instead of me. Uh, a brief background about me, I got my PhD in electrical and computer engineering from UC San Diego in 2009. I'm currently solving data science problems at Origami Logic. Uh, we are an exciting young startup. We just launched our search-based marketing intelligence platform a few months ago. We work with global brands on large unstructured marketing data sets. And we're using Sparks for heavy lifting on the analytics backend. Here's the brief overview of the talk. Uh, I'll first start with a very simple decision tree 101. We'll then discuss distributed decision tree implementation in the Spark MLlib library. We'll talk about experimental results on distributed data sets. Um, we'll also speak about how these trees can be used as building blocks for ensemble algorithms, which are very popular in practice, such as boosting and random forests. And finally, we'll speak about the direction of the future work. So imagine if we were given a binary classification problem uh, for this toy data set, which has two features. First feature is horsepower, which is a continuous feature. And the second one is weight, which is a categorical feature. And our task was to pr predict mileage, which is, again, a categorical feature that takes two values, low and high. In order to construct a decision tree, we would first start with the input data set, which had four high labels and two low labels, and a set of splitting conditions, or what we call as split candidates. These are all the unique feature values for every feature. Upon selecting a split, we will end up dividing the data set into two. So if we select, if weight equals high as a splitting condition, we end up dividing the data set on the left side, which meets the splitting criteria, with two high labels and no low label. And on the right side, we get two high and two low labels. So what we have done by selecting this split is we are trying to reduce the variability in the children nodes. And in decision tree jargon, this is called maximizing information gain. We also see that there is no information gain possible on the left-hand side since there are no low labels left. And we always predict high mileage in this scenario. On the right-hand side, we still have work to do since there are equal distribution of low and high labels. So we perform the same procedure on the right-hand side, and we eventually come up with the mileage classification tree that looks like this. If weight is high, we predict high mileage. If not, we look at horsepower. And if horsepower is less than equal to 86, we predict high mileage, else we predict low mileage. So what we saw is a very simple decision tree implementation. However, they are fairly complex in practice. So why are they popular? First and foremost, they are easier to implement, uh, interpret uh, compared to other machine learning algorithms. They can handle categorical variables. They are suitable for both classification and regression tasks. They do not, they do not require feature scaling. They can capture nonlinearities and feature interactions. <coughs> they can also handle missing values in your data set. And finally, ensembles of decision trees such as boosting a random forest work very well in practice. So, so let's discuss the decision distributed implementation in the MLLib library. But before doing that, we'll take a look at a single machine implementation. In a single machine implementation, typically the data set is loaded in memory as a matrix or a data frame. Mm -hmm. And then we perform several passes of the over the data to find the best split. I can hear you in the back. OK. Is this better? Sorry about that. Change it out. No, no, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. I mean, it's going to go around.
samples from you use both. So they're, they're recording. I forgot. Sorry about that. Sorry for the interruption. All right, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Imagine two samples from our data set were distributed on each of the two ma three machines. So how do we construct a decision tree in this scenario? Well, the first thought comes to mind is one could learn a separate decision tree on each of these machines and combine them using the single machine implementation. However, if you notice closely, in this scenario, there are only low labels on the first and third machine and high labels on the second machine. Of course, it's an extreme case, but you can see that it does not work for all data partitioning. And also, we still need to do inter-machine communication to combine these models. So we wanted to do a truly distributed implementation. And we first read the Planet paper, which is the paper from Google about creating distributed decision trees using MapReduce. However, it's not open source. We then turned to Hadoop MapReduce. However, we didn't find many mature implementations when we started about 12 months ago. Currently, there is R Hadoop, Mahout, HexData, and a few more. <coughs> Finally, we wanted to create decision trees on top of Spark since it's designed for iterative machine learning. However, there was no tree support in the initial versions, as Amit pointed out. And secondly, we felt that we can extend the planet implementation with several optimizations of our own. And that's the motivation for our work. So in order to do a distributed implementation, we had to make one approximation. If you've seen in the toy example, we used every unique value for a, for a continuous feature as a split candidate. However, it is co costly to do that in a distributed setting. Secondly, sorted splits are desirable for fast computation. Again, this would require a distributed sort over the data set. Finally, high cardinality of splits, that is too many splits per feature, would lead to significant computation and communication overhead. So we ended up using approximate quantiles instead of all unique feature values for our implementation. This is a standard trade-off to get significant improvement in training time without much loss in accuracy. And it's also been done in the Planet paper. Our first implementation was a MapReduce implementation, where in the map operation, or the flat map in Spark terminology, we take an instance, and we emit out a list of split label combinations <laughs> for all the splitting criteria that have been met. After the shuffle on the, on the reduce or the reduce by key in operation, we take a split and the list of corresponding labels, and we calculate the label histograms for that split. Let's use an example to understand this better. Imagine if we had a single instance with horsepower 76, weight as high and as mileage as low. We would end up emitting six split label combinations. The first split is obvious weight equals high. The second split is horsepower less than equals to 76, all the way to horsepower less than equals to 95. On the reduce side, we would take one split at a time and the list of corresponding labels and would come up with the label histograms. So for the split weight equals high, there are two high labels and no low label. And since we already know the label histograms at the parent node, we can also calculate the histograms for the opposite split. So when weight is not high, we have two low labels and two high labels. So this is all the information we need for doing the information gain calculation. So in general, if we have k features, m splits per feature, and n instances, the map operation emits order of k times m times n values for best split computation at a node. So this leads to significant communication overhead. The question is, can we do better? A map operation in MapReduce is essential when the keys are not known in advance. For example, words in word count. However, we already know the R splits in advance. And we also know the structure of those splits. So if we can somehow avoid the map operation, we can avoid the object creation overhead that comes with it. And we can also avoid the communication overhead due to the shuffle phase. So what we ended up doing is we, we started with an input data set which was spread over multiple <coughs> partitions over several machines. And we created partial statistics for each split candidate on, on these machines. 
and combine them to come up with sufficient statistics for every split candidate. The sufficient statistics were the left and right child node statistics for each split. For classification, we just needed to keep track of the label counts as we saw in the toy example. For regression, we need the count, sum, and sum of squares. The second optimization that we did was to exploit the sorted nature of the split. Imagine we were predicting mileage from horsepower. We would, and we would first put the split candidates on a line. As you can see, the three split candidates, seven horsepower less than equal to 70, less than equals to 86, and less than equals to 90 in orange, red, and green. And we would start making, going through each instance as, at a time. The first instance doesn't, splatify, uh, doesn't satisfy any splitting criteria, and hence it goes to the right-hand side of each split. The second one only satisfies the green splitting criteria, and so on and so forth. So what we have seen is, we have for every instance, we have to update the label histograms for every split. Again, can we do better? And the way to do that is by treating the region between each split between two splits as a bin and just updating them over uh, updating them just once for every instance so the the way we do that is when when we pass over the f the first instance we just update the bin between 90 and plus infinity for the second one we update the bin between 86 and 90 for the third one we update the bin between minus infinity and 70 and for, for the fourth one, we update the bin between 70 and 86. Now, if you notice closely, we can compute the split histograms below from the bin histograms or the intermediate bin histograms that we just calculated. For example, for the orange split, the left-hand side label histograms are just the first bin histogram, and the right-hand side label histograms are a combination of rest of the bin histograms. So if we have m splits per feature, the binning using binary search takes just log m steps versus m split comparisons that we were performing. And secondly, we just need to make one update per bin per feature instead of m when we were doing the, the split-based uh, histogram calculation. So these are significant savings in computation. The third optimization we did was to avoid or to reduce the number of passes we make over the training data set. So if we had to train a decision, uh, a best, if we had to train a, train a decision tree at node one, we would first select a best split candidate and we would use a filtered version of the original data set at node two. At node three, we would use another filtered version, which is just the opposite filter of what we use at node three. So instead of creating these data sets in memory, one could, and just moving them, these data structures in and out, we could just work on top of the original data set by applying filters. Secondly, any instance that doesn't belong to node two always belongs to node three. So in general, one can train these nodes in parallel. And we took this further and we ended up doing level-wise training of nodes. That is, we trained all nodes at a given level of the decision tree in parallel. So these gives us signific significant savings. So we end up making L passes instead of two raised to L minus one for the full tree. So at depth four, we are just making four passes over the data set instead of 15. These are already significant savings for shallow decision trees. At depth 10, we are making 10 passes instead of one, zero, two, three. So this is one of the optimization that gave us a lot of reduction in training time. Let's talk about the decision tree features in the MLlib library thus far. Uh, we have binary classification and regression support in Spark release 1.0. We have categorical variable support also in release 1.0. We have support for arbitrarily deep trees in 1.1. Support for multi-class classification is also a part of 1.1. And also there's work being done by Joseph Bradley at Databricks for the Python API for release 1.1. Now let's uh, take a look at some experimental results. The first experiment that we did was a strong scaling experiment. In strong scaling, you keep the data set size the same and you 
vary the number of machines in the cluster to see how your implementation scales with the number of resources. On the x-axis, you have the number of machines. And on the y-axis, you have the speed up. Compared to the baseline case, the baseline case in this scenario is 20 million samples with 20 features on two workers. So if you go from two to four machines, you sh the ideal speed up, which is the yellow line, is two. Going from two to eight leads to a speed up of four. And going from two to 16 gives you a speed up of eight. And here are our experimental results. And we, s we are performing within 10% of the ideal curve, which is great. And the reason for the discrepancy is the additional computation overhead that you get by adding more machines into your cluster. We performed several such strong scaling experiments using a synth synthetic data set, which ranged from 10 to 50 million instances, 10 to 50 features, 2 to 16 machines. So the data sets ended up taking anywhere between 700 megabytes to 18 gigabytes in memory. And the average speed up going from 2 to 16 machines was 6.6x, which is great since the ideal is 8x. We then proceeded to perform large scale experiments. And this is thanks to Yahoo. Uh, Hiraki Indu performed these experiments on a classification problem on half a billion instances with 20 features. So this ended up taking a 90 gigabytes of shared distributed memory. On the x-axis, you have the number of machines, which range from 30 to 600. And on the y-axis, you have the training time in seconds. The yellow line corresponds to a tree of depth 3, the blue line to a tree of depth 5, and the purple line to a tree of depth 10. The first insight was, yes, the algorithm scales to really large data sets. We also noticed that deep trees require much more computation as expected compared to shallow trees. Uh, there are two reasons for that. First is you need to train more levels, at uh, more nodes at a given level as you keep going deeper into a tree. And secondly, you have to apply more filtering criteria. And the third thing is we observe a very interesting computation versus communication trade-off. So pay a close attention to the yellow line on the curve. If we see, notice carefully at the, the training time while going from, increased slightly when going from 100 to 150 machines. And this was due to the fact that as we kept adding more machines, the computation overhead went down, but the communication overhead started kicking in. And as we added more machines, the training time kept increasing slightly. Uh, we don't observe this phenomena for a tree of depth 10, but we conjecture that if we kept adding more machines into the cluster, even beyond 600, we would have seen this uh, at some point. I'll now briefly discuss ensemble algorithms. Uh, the Al ensemble algorithms such as random forests and boosting are very popular in practice. And they can be easily built using trees as building blocks. There are two main families of algorithms. The first is boosting, such as adder boost and gradient boosting, which are sequential in nature, and random forests, where one can actually do a parallelly, embarrassingly parallel computation. So adder boost is the classic boosting algorithm where which, which is originally developed for classification, where you are learning a new tree model every iteration, and you reweight these weights for each of these instances based upon an error calculation. And the adder boost was very simple to implement. Uh, it's, it's just 15 lines of code. Uh, I just don't want to get into the details, but there are two main uh, parts. Here we are training a new tree every iteration. And here, we are just reweighting the samples. Gradient boosting is similar. Instead of reweighting um, the samples, we actually relabel. So we calculate a new label for each instance, or new value for each, each instance, based upon a pseudo res residual calculation. It's a very popular algorithm for regression tasks, and can support pluggable loss functions. So here are some optimizations that we are thinking about uh, for the boosting implementations. As you keep going through the iterations, you end up with a long linear chain for the RDDs. And what we have seen in some ex experiments that we are conducting right now is if you checkpoint every n iterations, and this n ideal n number we haven't figured out yet, you, you, lead, you get a drastic improvement in training time. 
Now let's move on to random forest. In random forest, you start with a input training data stored as an RDD, and you come up with n bootstrap samples where n is the number of trees in your data set. Then you uh, train uh, decision trees on each of these data sets with a slight twist. Instead of using all splits, you use a random subset of splits for best split calculation at every node. And then you use all these models to come up with a joint prediction on top of the data. So the first thing we wanted to do was we wanted to avoid creating these bootstrap mem uh, samples in memory, uh, since it could lead to a huge overhead in cluster memory. So what we did is we applied a transformation to come up with the tree-weighted RDD, where each instance of the RDD has an additional field, which stores the number of occurrences of each sample in every tree. This is a standard optimization called Poisson re resampling, and it's also been used in other places such as BlinkDB for bootstrap-based calculations. The other optimization that we think will give us a huge benefit is level-wise training for all the trees at the same time. So instead of performing L passes over the data set, instead of performing number of trees times 2 raised to L minus 1, all passes over the data set, we'll end up just doing L passes over the data set. So we expect a lot of benefit coming from this optimization. Finally, let's talk about the direction of the future work. The ensemble algorithms are being worked at. We are in the uh, close to finishing some of the implementations and also testing some of them and should be a part of a release 1.2. Feature importances would be great to have for all the tree algorithms. Decision tree visualizations would also be cool to have. And finally, we want to test over a wide variety of data sets, so this is ongoing work. And here is the request from the community. Please take a look at the MLF documentation if you haven't. It's, I think it's fairly well written. You can easily get started by training decision trees or other MLLib algorithms on uh, just reading the user guide. Please test drive, test drive it over your own uh, data sets. Send us data sets of any shape or form, whether you have short and wide data sets, whether you have tall data sets. Uh, we have made some design choices while creating the algorithms, but uh, we want to make sure it covers most of the user's needs. And finally, send us any feature requests that you have or uh, any bugs that you have to report. Thank you. <laughs> any questions? So, do you have any restrictions on the number of values that the categorical attributes can take? Some of the we packages have got, you know, like... No, uh, we, we don't. Uh, we don't uh, right now. So for example, R has a limitation of, yeah. I think, 32. I, I don't think we have. We have a setting which specifies the number of bins, which you can increase to a larger amount if you have a lot of categorical variables. So yes, we made a conscious decision not to restrict the number of categorical variables. But, but ultimately, the histograms are brought back to the master. So like, if obviously, you Here can't can. have more than this million or 10 million categorical values. Okay. Sure. You, kind of, you have a little bit different problem if you've got a multi class problem, though, right, with regard to the, with regard to the number of categories. <coughs> exactly. Yeah, okay. So part of it's because you've got the binary. The, the, that's for the class. Yeah, okay. okay. What is your cluster management system? Hmm. Yeah, the cluster management system, I think Evan and Hirakindu can speak better, but I think the first experiment, the, the strong scaling experiments were done on a standalone cluster. Yeah, Spark standalone cluster. And the Yahoo experiments were done on... The lab state data experiment done at Yahoo that was on a Yarn cluster. Sure. Uh, I don't. When you say binning, is it for the continuous features or for the. Yeah, like the quantile approximation. So the question is 
the accuracy or it, the performance? No, the accuracy. Yeah, so uh, I, I did some comparisons of my own one on some data sets that I have using uh, percentiles. I saw, I think, 2 to 3% uh, uh, degradation in the uh, area under the curve for some of my binary classification data sets. However, these quantiles are configurable. So you can actually increase the number of quantiles to get higher accuracy. So you can, instead of going from percentiles, you could use 100,000 quantiles if you want to get better accuracy on your data set. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thanks. So, you know, just with regard to the binning, I've heard some people worry about how you pick the point that you're going to use to do the split inside of the bin. And Mm -hmm. And some concern that maybe you needed to randomize that selection in order to keep from having a, you know, a bias introduced by the, you know, the way you pick the split point out of the bin. Short and say we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be good to talk about later yeah, if yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> uh, we haven't thought about this before. Yeah. I think I'm done. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Better, good, no? Okay, good. All right, hi everyone. Uh, so I am Evan Sparks. Um, uh, first, my apologies if you came to my Spark Summit talk. Uh, this talk is gonna be uh, very similar, uh, but, uh, but hopefully uh, still maybe you'll get something out of it the second time around. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the system we're calling Ghostface for now. Uh, and Amit acted like this is my idea, but you know he's a co-author on the, on the paper we submitted with, uh, with this as the title, so uh, <laughs> he's just as guilty. Uh, anyway, this is uh, joint work uh, at Berkeley with uh, Amit, uh, Mike Franklin, Mike Jordan, and Tim Kraska. Um, so let's get into it. So uh, first, uh, this is a picture many of you have probably seen some version of. Uh, but this is the picture of the, the current state or, or nearly current state of the badass stack uh, that we're building at Berkeley. So uh, the idea here is, you know, large scale distributed analytics. Uh, one thing that has changed most notably is, of course, uh, Shark is now uh, being replaced by Spark SQL. Um, and GraphX and MLlib and MLbase are, are no longer just in development there in uh, s some level of supported release. Uh, but this talk, you know, I'm going to be focused on the machine learning part of the stack. Um, but, uh, you know, just keep in mind that this stuff is all part of this, this bigger ecosystem uh, uh, for large-scale data analytics. So uh, what is MLBase? So MLBase is a project we've been working on for the last couple of years designed to make distributed machine learning easier. Uh, so easier both for developers, people developing new algorithms who want their code to run uh, quickly and efficiently on a cluster um, and maybe not have to worry so much about cluster management and software configurations and so on, but also and also not necessarily to have to think so hard about exactly how, how to make their alg algorithms distribute. Uh, and then the second uh, piece is 
um, making uh, machine learning easier for end users as well. So people who are, you know, maybe somebody like a business analyst or a data scientist who, uh, who understands how data works and knows they want to build a model on their data, uh, but doesn't want to figure out what the difference between uh, various kernels for SVM or how to set their, you know, learning rate for gradient descent are. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, this platform is built on top of Spark, uh, and uh, I'll get into s some of the details of it in a bit. So you've already seen the SAC diagram tonight. Uh, Apache Spark is sort of our core for computation. It's this, uh, as everybody here hopefully knows, this fast distributed runtime. Uh, MLlib is this optimized library, sort of think of this as, you know, like the lap hack uh, for, uh, for machine learning on Spark. So optimized library of standard machine learning functionality. So all the you know, sort of regression uh, algorithms and classification algorithms that you're used to seeing in other packages, um, but built to run efficiently on the cluster. Uh, next up is MLI, which is an experimental API uh, designed to simplify the implementation of these new algorithms uh, and feature extractors. Uh, a bunch of features uh, from MLI, as Amit mentioned, are being incorporated into ML, uh, MLlib in uh, the next couple releases of Spark. So expect to see more of that stuff kind of percolating its way down the stack. And most of what I'm going to talk to about tonight is the ML optimizer. So this is uh, designed to be a, a declarative layer uh, simplified to simplify access to large-scale machine learning uh, for end users. So uh, we certainly want some help uh, on you know, adding new algorithms to MLlib, uh, writing documentation, testing, <coughs> throwing new data sets at us, et cetera. Uh, that's, that's all great stuff um, from the, that we've gotten terrific feedback on from the community. Uh, but in this talk, I'm going to talk about some of the sort of crazy research ideas that are happening uh, at the top of the stack with MLopt. So what do we mean uh, when we're talking about building machine learning models? So let's, let's start with a simple machine learning pipeline. So you say, OK, I've got, I've got some data. It's sitting in a database or you know, distributed in HDFS. And now I'm going to run some feature extraction on it. And then I might train some model. And out comes this model thing that I can use to make predictions on my data. And that's, that sounds awesome. And this is you know, sort of the standard textbook process you might follow. But in reality, this, uh, this process is, is sort of a highly iterative one from, you know, from an end user's perspective. Somebody who's developing new models doesn't usually get to do this thing end to end in one go and have it work the first time. Usually there are loops. So you might have to go back, uh, go back to your data source and figure out, oh, I need to incorporate uh, this extra information about my user. Uh, you might have to do fancier feature extraction. So if you're just doing text, maybe you started with n-grams and you want to do TF-IDF. Uh, model training, you might have to iterate a few times between um, you know, SVM versus, uh, versus decision trees versus logistic regression. You might have to try different things there. And even once you've decided on a particular model family, try a bunch of different settings for, for the parameters for these things. Uh, and so uh, our grand vision here is to, is to automate the construction of these pipelines um, you know, end to end. So start from data and get, get me a model. Uh, and we think that you know, maybe that's biting off a little more than we can chew uh, in one go. So we're going to start with just uh, this one aspect of, of uh, iterating on these pipelines, and that is model selection or model search. Uh, so today I'm, I'm really just going to be talking about focusing on this one box. So fix your features and now figure out what the best model is given these features uh, for my learning task. So a quick refresher, and, and maybe everyone in this room already, already knows this, but let's talk about what it means to train a model. And this is, this is what I mean when I'm saying talking about training a model. So uh, in general, the process goes something like this. Uh, for each point in my data set, uh, I'm going to compute some delta. Uh, so delta to the model. This might, in a gradient descent uh, model, this might be you know, the, the, uh, the value of the gradient uh, with, uh, of the loss function. Um, and I'm going to repeat that into uh, convergence. For different kinds of models, this delta might be something different. So for decision trees, it might be deltas to the, the histograms that Manish was talking about just a minute ago. For naive bays, it might be up, uh, updating my probabilities. Uh, but from a systems perspective, this all basically looks the same. I'm taking you know, iterative passes uh, over my data, uh, sequential scans of my data sets, ho hopefully in parallel. Uh, and so just to give you an idea, you know, we're, we're thinking you know, in terms of what's training one model. Well, we're talking about probably minutes, even on you know, a modestly sized cl cluster, to train a 200 uh, model on a 200 gigabyte data set. 
So this is, you know, if you're, this is basically the facets that your memory and CPU can, can tolerate when you're, when you're really uh, saturating the cores. So that, that's pretty good. You know, 200 gigabyte data sets are pretty big. Uh, but we see more and more of those coming around. And if that's the time to train one model, uh, it, it can take a very long time to train lots of models. And so the tricky part here is to say, you know, there, are, there isn't just one family of model that we have to worry about training. There are lots of different models. So we know, you know, just in MLlib, we have logistic regression, we've got SVMs, we've got tree-based models, and several others. Uh, each of these models also has several hyperparameters. So they've got a, a learning rate or a regularization or some per perturbations. You might have the width of the bins and the histograms or uh, which uh, impurity metric you want to use when, when computing your decision tree. And so this, this prevents this space of hyperparameters and algorithms that you've got to optimize over. Uh, in addition, you, you might have this additional layer of featureization. Uh, you know, for text, I mentioned n-grams and TF-IDF. There are other types of features you might want to compute on your data. Um, but you know, again, for this talk, we're really just going to talk about this algorithm and hyperparameter plane. And hopefully later, uh, in later research, we can get to this featureization thing as well as part of the same search space. So one approach, uh, if you want to try out a bunch of different models and figure out what, what are the settings that gives me kind of a, a really good thing that I can use uh, you know, again and again, one approach might be something like trying it all. So a common approach that people use in practice is, is grid search. So if I have a very simple hyperparameter space, which is just two, two dimensions, a learning rate and a regularization parameter, both continuous values, I, you know, I chunk up these continuous values over, the, over some grid. Uh, and I try, and, and maybe my best answer is somewhere near a uh, grid point down there on, the, on this space. And I'm going to try uh, ev training a model uh, with the setting up in that corner. And then I'm going to try training another model with the setting in that corner. And I'm going to look at something like the cross-validated error or something like that to see, uh, to see how good my model actually is. And I'm going to keep doing this. And you can kind of see the nested for loops in your head, right? And finally, you, you fill up the grid. Uh, and you know, after a bunch of evaluations, maybe you pick the one that's somewhere close to that best answer. Uh, but again, each of these red dots is, you know, on a decent sized data set, is maybe minutes to compute. Uh, and, the, and the curse of dimensionality gets us very quickly as we start to add more parameters here. So the volume of this hypercube grows and grows uh, exponentially. Uh, but people often do some version of this in practice when they're trying to figure out, okay, what model should I actually run uh, in production? And so I'm going to talk tonight ab about what we think is, is sort of a better approach. Uh, and we're going to combine three optimizations uh, in this distributed setting uh, to see if we can get to a best answer very quickly on very large data sets, uh, or much quicker than, than this sort of conventional approach. So the three, uh, the three ideas are better resource utilization through batching. So instead of tra training one, one point at a time, if I know I'm going to be training lots of models, maybe I can train multiple at once in parallel. I'm going to do some algorithmic speed ups. So instead of training all of these points all the way to completion, if things aren't looking very good, I can, uh, maybe I can uh, stop some of them early and, and allocate my resources elsewhere. And I'm going to do some better search. So instead of exploring this whole grid in sort of this nested for loop fashion, I can maybe uh, get to a, a good answer quicker by, by using a, you know, some kind of search technique. Uh, so I'll dive into each of these optimizations in a little bit more detail now. So first is this, this idea of better resource utilization through batching. So the key insight here is that modern memory speeds are often much slower than, than processor speeds. So uh, on, in modern memory, I can read something like uh, four, four or five gigs a second per core. Uh, that's, that equates to like half a billion doubles uh, read from, from in binary from my, from my memory. Uh, but the, a lot of these, uh, these cores can do something like 15 billion blocks per, uh, flops per second per core. So this is something called machine imbalance. And this is something highlighted uh, by folks over the years. Uh, the stream benchmark is, is, uh, is a benchmark that's been tracking this uh, on supercomputers since the late 70s and has been looking at this idea uh, for, uh, for desktops more recently. But basically, you know, you've got this imbalance between the amount of computation we can do and the amount of uh, data we can read from memory. So what does this actually mean for modeling? So a typical model update in the context of one of these gradient comp computations or tree computations uh, requires something like two or four flops per double that we read from memory. So uh, in my gradient computation, I might have to take the dot product with the existing weight vector and do some, some addition, uh, something like that. 
So the, the computation requirements are actually pretty modest for one of these model updates. Um, but that means that we can do something like seven to 10 model updates in the same amount of time we can do one just by using sort of otherwise idle cycles uh, on the processor. And so this is assuming that, that models themselves are relatively small and fit in cache, and I'm not thrashing the model back and forth out of memory. Um, but uh, nevertheless, this means that I can train mul multiple models simultaneously. If I'm in this context where I know I'm gonna, I'm gonna be training multiple models at once anyway, this is, this is highly valuable. So what do we, we see when we actually implement this in MLI? And so the, the table here to focus on is the, is the, is the lower one here. Uh, and we, what we did here was ve uh, vary both the complexity of the model, so you know, anywhere from 100 to 10,000 features, and the, uh, the number of models that we trained in parallel. And this is on uh, 16 machines. And what we see is uh, you know, anywhere from you know, uh, uh, you know, 1.5x 1. 5, 1. speed up for the most complicated models, all the way up to a 5x speed up for uh, for simpler models. So that's pretty good. Uh, and there's some overheads here due to boxing and unboxing and, and Scala and, and all that. Uh, but that's pretty good, especially for the, the sort of simpler models. Uh, but we decided that this wasn't quite getting us to where we wanted to, or we weren't quite getting to that theoretical limit of 7 to 10x that we were hoping for. Uh, and so we, we implemented this in, in a slightly different way, where we leverage bl BLAST and we realized that you know, this, this problem for, for a lot of these gradient models comes down to matrix matrix multiply. And so matrix matrix multiply is something that's been optimized uh, like crazy for the last 30 years. And so we just call into the, the right library and our speed up numbers go from you know, the sort of modest 1.15x to 5x in the most uh, complicated case, uh, all the way up to 7x in, in some other cases. So this is pretty exciting, actually. By, by leveraging these you know, well-tuned, well-studied libraries, we can get close to sort of our theoretical limit. There's still some stuff to do here, uh, but we think we can, get, uh, we can continue to make these a little bit faster. So that's it for sort of the, the insight of, of maybe we can train multiple models in parallel uh, you know, using, the, using these idle cycles. The second piece is, uh, is algorithmic speedups. So uh, the insight here is, is realizing that a lot of these machine learning algorithms are really uh, iterative in nature. So I'm, I'm plotting here a loss curve uh, you know, over, while over the training, uh, course of the training cycle for two different models, model A and model B, let's call them. And we can see, you, know, you and I, as humans, we can see that, that the model on the, in red uh, gets to much better loss much more quickly than the model in blue. Uh, and we could, we could validate this during model training time pretty easily. Uh, so you know, each of the, the points in our hyperparameter space, if we're talking about that, that search space, that grid I talked about, uh, it represents training a full model. But uh, in fact, we might not actually want to train all of these models all the way to completion. If model training is an iterative pro process, maybe we look at this model in blue uh, and we see that, that it, it doesn't look like it's going to make much more progress, so we kill it early. Uh, and so that's really the heuristic we're using. We're saying, you know, if uh, I've got a budget of, of 10 or 100, uh, say I've got 100 iterations budgeted to train my model, uh, and I realize after 10 iterations it hasn't made much progress, I just kill it early. Now, people, you know, principal uh, mathematicians in the room might be cringing because how do you know that that blue thing isn't going to get below the red thing? Well, we don't. Uh, so, and you know, we're. <laughs> I, sh I should say we're working on theory for this. Uh, there's some really in interesting stuff in multi-arm bandits, uh, upper confidence bounds, and so on. Uh, thinking about w when is, is this sort of a principled thing to do, but when we try it out in practice, uh, we see an, a pretty incredible savings in terms of uh, number of ep epochs. So we can throw away a lot of the models that look like they're junk with a very, very limited hit on uh, sort of model performance. So model error of the best mo model when we uh, turn this uh, optimization on is always within a percent or two uh, in terms of accuracy for these classification problems we looked at. And we tried this on five different data sets. This is by no means exhaustive, but I think it kind of makes the point that a heuristic like this could really uh, help you a bunch. Uh, and there are certainly other things we can do here to sort of accelerate the, the training of in, any individual model. We could use these uh, fancier uh, advanced gradient techniques, quasi-Newton methods like Adagrad or LBFGS uh, to sp speed up convergence. And that's certainly something we could turn on, especially since things like LBFGS are now in, uh, in MLlib or will be very shortly. Uh, 
So that's the, that's the second optimization, this, this heuristic thing, this algorithmic speed up, and, and recognizing that, that we know something about how the algorithms are, are proceeding. So the last, the last piece I'm going to talk about is imp improved search. So instead of doing this grid thing where we you know, write our nested for loops and try everything out, uh, what are the other methods? So it turns out that uh, there's this, uh, this, this long history of something called derivative-free optimization. So we've got this big, weird search space. We don't know the form of the function that, that uh, this thing is taking, but we can sample points from it. And so how do we find a global maximum or minimum uh, given, given this setup? Uh, and so it turns out that there are a bunch of these, these techniques. Uh, and forgive me, the, the chart is a little bit difficult to read. Uh, but, uh, but basically, we, have, we evaluated, uh, I guess, six different or seven different uh, uh, search techniques, uh, some dating back to the 60s and 70s. Nelder, Mead, and Powell's method are these derivative-free opti numerical optimization techniques. Um, we also tried grid search and random search. And uh, what we did was we, we tried these seven methods on, on, again, five different data sets. And we, we looked at you know, how well they did, how well they get to a good, good error when they try searching over these spaces. Uh, and so uh, you know, two of the more recent methods, or three of the more recent methods, are Spearmint, SMAC, and TPE. These are things that are very recently published at, at NIPS uh, just in the last couple of years. Uh, and uh, this is sort of the auto-tuning ML community. Um, and what we see, what we want to see in this graph is uh, red bars that are low, okay? So that means fewest function calls we get to a good answer. And so what we end up seeing, surprisingly, is that, uh, is that random search works amazingly well, shockingly well, uh, which is not, you know, my advisor said, oh, that means you've got research to do. Uh, but, uh, but it turns out that, that uh, SMAC and TPE actually work slightly better than random search, as, as we would expect them to. Uh, the, the more classical methods are sort of not, uh, uh, not well suited to this problem because they assume unconstrained uh, parameter spaces. They also don't make any assumptions about having categorical vari variables or conditional variables uh, in your search spaces. So we didn't really expect those to do well, but we wanted to check them out. Um, so anyway, uh, we went ahead and implemented this at scale, and we put it all together on top of Spark. And so this is the first version of the, of the ML-based optimizer, getting towards that goal of, of somebody saying, declaring, I have this learning problem, figure out the best way to get to a model for me. Uh, and so you know, we tried it on sort of a, a medium scale data set, I guess, 30 gigs of, of dense image features, uh, 240K by 16K learning problem. We did binary classification on this, and we considered two model families. Uh, so uh, logistic regression and SVM, we're actually working on adding some more models, families to that right now, uh, and more hyperparameters to tune. Uh, but the bottom line is that with, you know, sort of regardless of the search method you use, you're probably, uh, you know, the, in terms of raw clock time, it doesn't really matter. You're going to take 40 hours to try 128 different models on these things. If we turn on the early stopping and the uh, and the um, uh, sorry the uh, if we turn on the early stopping technique and the batching technique, uh, we see a reduction uh, anywhere from 10 to 20x in terms of total clock, clock time, and we actually see uh, you know turning on these these optimizations and trying it all out, uh, we get a significant uh, reduction in the amount of time that we take to actually get to a good model. And so that's, that's sort of the, the whole punchline, is we want to be able to do that much faster. And so we then uh, tried this out on a much larger data set, so 1.5 terabyte data set, 128 nodes, uh, literally you know, thousands of passes over the data. Uh, and we were able to train 32 models to completion in 15 hours and get a, a pretty decent model in 11 hours. Uh, this probably would have taken close to a week or longer. Uh, if we had done sort of the traditional naive approach with grid search. So this is getting to something that works in sort of human time. Maybe you kick it off overnight and you can check the results in the morning. I'm hoping that we can get this down to the point that you can try it out on your lunch break. Uh, maybe we won't get to the point where we can do it in a couple minutes, but who knows? Uh, Moore's law is, is good for that. <laughs> or more money. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so next I just want to touch briefly on sort of this, this uh, this concept of, of moving this to real world, world pipeline. So we're, we've, we've sort of talked about how we're going to fix the features uh, in, in feature extraction, and we're going to try this model training process over and over again. But what does it mean to sort of uh, to, uh, train uh, and, and do model search on a much more complicated pipeline, an automatically tune a pipeline? 
So a real world pipeline might look something more like this. It's a lot more complicated. Uh, and this is a, a real pipeline from, uh, for image classification based on uh, uh, coats and ink. Uh, we've got this uh, coded up in the lab and actually a nice DSL for putting these things together uh, that you can look for coming out in the next few months uh, released to open source. But uh, it's, it's this complicated thing, right? You, you start with your raw data. You might have to parse the images. You do some normalization. Maybe you estimate some patches that you want to convolve your images with. You do the convolution. You do some rectification and pooling, and, and so on and so on. And then at test time, even, even the test pipeline is, is kind of complicated. Uh, and it turns out that you know, there are hyperparameters to tune here. So in red, I've kind of highlighted the boxes that have lots of hyperparameters to tune. Um, you know, this whole, how do I, you know, which, what kind of pooling do I do? How do I convolve my images, et cetera? These are all, uh, you know, hyperparameters for this big search space I'm talking about. Uh, so what we're working on is, you know, how do we take this stuff that we've done for model search on, on you know, a handful of hyperparameters and scale it up to something that's more like this? And what kind of gains do we get by searching over this space, you know, more efficiently, more effectively? Uh, so so that's, that's what's going on now, and I'm afraid I don't have any res results to report yet, but you know, wait a couple months, hopefully we'll get there. Uh, so future work, um, we're, we're talking about thinking about using these multi-arm bandit strategies to tr choose between uh, model families and sort of a more principled approach to this early stopping heuristic. We're looking into how we can uh, use, you know, use the fact that we're, we're trying a lot of models out sounds kind of like ensembling. We might get models out as sort of a byproduct of the search process that actually work decently well and can add some more information versus a single model that you get at the end. Uh, we're talking about levering, leveraging sampling. So maybe you don't have to train on that whole 1.5 terabyte data set. Maybe you can take a sample of it, start to bootstrap a pretty good model, and then maybe train the whole thing on the, the full data set. Using faster learning methods, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, and better parallelism for, for smaller data sets. So, uh, you know, thinking about sort of flipping the problem on its head. Uh, if I've got a small data set, but I still want to do this model search thing, maybe I can broadcast the data set out to all my nodes and then do the search in parallel. And I think that's something that's probably pretty common that people, people want. So we're, we're thinking about how we, how we best do that under this setting. Uh, and then the last piece is uh, incorporating feature extraction into the pipeline and, and tuning the, the hyperparameters of feature selection. I think that's going to be very important uh, in terms of actually getting this out into the real world. Uh, finally, people always say, oh, well, you're, you're trying all these models out. You're trying everything. Eventually, you're going to get one that sticks. And this is a problem that statisticians have been studying for a very long time uh, you know, in the sort of field of multiple hypothesis testing. We're, we're aware of these issues. We definitely are planning on incorporating in them into this work in the future. But uh, you know, f again, future work. So with that, uh, happy to take any questions that anybody has about the talk or the research. Uh, and also happy to talk to people offline afterwards. Thanks. Yeah, in the back. Sure, sure. So we, uh, we focused ourselves on supervised learning problems, so where we have labeled data. I think uh, you know, applying these techniques to unsupervised learning problems is, is sort of uh, tougher, um, but definitely interesting work. Um, the actual data sets we tested them out on, we used a, bu a bunch of the UCI data sets for sort of smaller scale experiments to kind of figure out what sort of works and what doesn't. Uh, and then at the larger scale, so far we're, we're focused on uh, image classification uh, kind of data sets. So we took uh, features extracted by sort of standard feature extractors and image, uh, image processing, and then ran our, our search over those. Uh, mostly that was because of a lack of lots of large scale data sets. So if, if people have large scale data sets they want to make available to the academic community, please do. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think you know those methods were invented uh, with good reason, and like physicists have been using them for good things uh, for a long time. I think the the real issue here is that the hyperparameter space is sort of um, is this weird shaped thing. It's not like a nice regular five continuous variables you want to search over. It's it's nested. It's kind of nasty. 
Yep. Yeah. So Google has this service of machine learning service where you feed the data and build the model for you and then it goes through and you check uh, that one. Any idea what technique they might be using? Because it looks like they're solving the same problem that you're trying to solve. Yeah, I have no idea what technique they're actually uh, using. They haven't uh, written about this publicly. Uh, the data sets that you can submit to that service are limited to 500 megabytes, so for large-scale learning problems, it's just not palatable. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's something fairly simple. I, you know, uh, those Google guys are pretty smart, though, so who knows? Yeah? Are you familiar with the parameter server model, the IMAX model, and the Google Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the parameter server work is uh, by Alex Mola et al. is, is uh, kind of based on this idea that you may have a very, very large model. Uh, and this comes up a lot in convolutional neural networks where you're estimating models that may have billions of parameters. And so shipping those models around in their entirety is not really feasible. And oftentimes you're making updates to very small sections of them. Uh, so I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I could see a uh, anytime uh, you know, the next MLLib algorithm that comes out that has a uh, model that's, that's too big even to broadcast, that's where I, the first place I would think to put a uh, parameter server. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting work, but a little bit orthogonal to this model search thing. There's an interesting concept there about trade-off Yeah. Okay, yeah, I should, I should look at it more through that lens. That's, that's interesting, thanks. Yep. So yeah, we it, we're still uh, we're still working with the the authors of Spearmint to kind of figure out what that is. Uh, my hunch at this point is that um, with some of these other methods, we provide more clues about basically our you know if you want to think like a Bayesian our priors on the uh, on the space. So for example, uh, in the in the TP uh, experiments. Uh, we tell it that we think that this parameter has, is log distributed, uh, whereas Spearmint does not get that information. So it m might be something as simple as that, that, that you know, these, we're, we're giving these other search methods a little more information and they're, they're performing better. Uh, but, but yeah, like I said, we're still working with the authors of that work on that. Yep. So the, the huge models we are generally seen in, uh, like I said, these convolutional neural nets. Uh, the biggest models we see in MLlib uh, are sort of the intermediate state maybe you see when you're doing uh, random forest or something like that. For the most part, these are small enough to fit uh, comfortably in, in memory, even on the driver. So we're not so worried about model st storage just yet, but as we wor start working toward these really big models, I think that's gonna be an issue. Yeah, we assume that our models are relatively small, can certainly fit in memory on one machine, basically, at this point. Uh, are fixed? Uh, yeah, no, the models are, not, are, are themselves not fixed. You know, they, they can update via, and in Spark 1.1, there's going to be some work on uh, updating models with Spark streaming. So that's, you know, computing deltas. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, it's certainly possible that these, uh, these search methods get trapped in local optimal. Lo local optimum. Uh, a bunch of them have uh, some notion of randomness uh, built in so that occasionally they'll pick something way outside of the space that they're currently searching to try and get out of these local optima. But uh, it's, you know, it's a problem you can certainly face, uh, particularly for these functions that may, not, may or may not be convex. All right, that's it. I think uh, I'm going to hand it over. Uh, if you have any more questions, please come talk to me offline.
Some of it is happening. What? Microsoft? Oh. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Cool. Uh, I guess, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for coming to Yahoo. And I think it's kind of getting late, but I will try to give you some overview about what we do at Yahoo for scalable machine learning. Uh, to start with, do I need the tools? I'm challenged. So the, uh, 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 to start with, let me just introduce myself. And uh, my name is Andy Fan. I'm an architect at Yahoo or big data team. At Yahoo, what I'm, well, we are working on like the big data platform, like Hadoop, all those things. And on the other hand, also spend, listen to this, spend huge majority percentage of my time on the machine learning stuff. And in the community uh, side, I'm kind of active in all those, the, whatever the thing associated with the big data. So like Hadoop, Spark, uh, Storm, all the stuff. So the for the uh, as you could imagine at Yahoo, machine learning play a uh, very important roles in every piece of our business. So you know you're thinking about all these like uh, news articles that we put it together on our at our web page, and like we do the search, you know, with the flickers, all the photo stuff, the all advertisement stuff. We are gathering huge amount, humongous amount of the data about the user, about the product, all those things. And then the challenge is, uh, you know, what do we do with those data? What do we learn from those data? And then try to uh, improve our service. So here is the, some examples. So the, uh, the Flickr is our uh, uh, image service. And that provide uh, like there was a one terabyte uh, free storage for all the pictures, the videos you guys you, you have. And until recently, all this, the image search on the Flickr is very basic, like you know, based on the users the tag you give to us. So that as a result, let's say at that point, if you do the Sunbird search, that's what you're going to see on the left. And recently, we added the. Uh, some of the deep le learning, others the others, uh, you know, uh, scalable machine learning on it. As a result, now what you see is the much better result for all users, right? And then I think you, I would encourage you to check out and just go to log into the Flickr. Just I think you, I would say, encourage you to search your pictures. Do a search. Type some keywords, say, just select, instead of look at everybody else's pictures, just select your pictures. You will surprise, even so you did not give us the tag, we found those things for you. Right? So that's the, one of the, I think, interesting use cases for the machine learning. Certainly we have other use cases, such like search. Like all the whole page, logically the whole page is based on machine learning. I will uh, explain a little bit uh, more uh, uh, later. Let's say there have some advertisement stuff, there's the content stuff. You know, all the pieces are uh, based on machine learning. So from the Yahoo point of view, I think we see a bunch of the different challenges from machine learning. One is the scale and another is the speed. And the scale kind of more or less is just the nature of the Yahoo business. So we, you know, we, when we try to do the machine learning, so we had, you know, try to deal with like hundreds of millions of tra uh, training examples. And then many of those cases we, you know, try to deal with the millions of the features, right? Then you, 
it's not like just we train you know small number of the models we you know train tens of thousands of models, and then again just like Evans talk you know they have all different algorithms we need to try, so we have a bunch of the you know uh, a dozens of algorithms actually inside the in house, and also we are working with the uh, you know open source communities on those uh, new al algorithms, as that what you heard the. And malicious talk that has the collaboration with our, you know, uh, scientists uh, here, Kendall, those guys. Right. So again, you could see, you know, it's really so we have feel a lot of challenge from the scaling side. The other side is the speed. So the, over the years, Yahoo has developed a bunch of the machine learning libraries, and some of the library are kind of simple. Some of them are try to be very fancy. But you could imagine because of the nature of all you know data size, all those complexities, some of those machine learning just takes a long time. But on the one hand, you know, if you think of the business we are in, we just simply could not afford so huge amount of data at time to spend on machine learning, right? Thinking about you know, we want to bring uh, up the break news, you know, onto the front page. Right? You know, how you find the model for those the, the news just short up, you know, how you quickly you know, build up the model for, for your users and quickly push out and to make the set a piece of the article available for the user who are interested in this. And the, I think the uh, other side is the nature of our user, right? So user, you know, you kind of, they are interested just, you know, keep changing, right? So that was, the, I think, the, I, I found it was an interesting uh, graph in the bottom of the page over there, that's the uh, Yahoo Today module on the offline page, that's the top page, is the, the article over there. So we, we found out that like, if you look into like how often people are you know, really looking into that page, you know, once the time passed, you know, nobody cares anymore. At one point, it's really hot, but once you pass a little bit, then nobody cares anymore. So all those, that means we need a machine learning algorithm and um, solutions that really be able to scale to deal with all huge number of data, all those things, and also we want to have a very fast uh, you know, speed. I think from that point of view, that's why we are uh, very, I think we are very happy to work with other communities on the uh, machine learning stuff. At this particular moment, we apply several design patterns at Yahoo. Kind of the, maybe kind of the make this more scary here, right? So the because of the nature, uh, like I said, so we have many of the algorithms, uh, machine learning algorithms are running on Hadoop. Right, so the, some of those algorithms are written in ma mappers, some of them, you know, running in the reducers, so some of them are uh, leveraging the Hadoop together with the MPIs, those other stuff. Then on the other hand, I think we have started the other the explorations to using the Spark-based machine learning algorithms. And that's why, you know, I think the I mean, MLLib certainly is a very promising library for us. And certain, you, at this point, I think from our point of view, it's very basic. But uh, we are, I think we are working with, we are, you know, intend to continue to work with the open source community and make it better. Then on the other hand, we also I think as some of the early talk, we also look into the real time machine learning. At this particular moment, we uh, Storm is the this, this choice for the streaming uh, processing at Yahoo. So we do a bunch of the uh, real time machine learning inside Storm. And then go beyond that, I think we are also some of the team are looking into the combination of like level you like Hadoop, Spark, Storm all together for their stuff. Right, so let me just give you uh, some example here, right? So here is the, is this, let me just walk through a few, uh, two slides about the Flickr uh, uh, auto tag. So what are we doing here for the Flickr? We apply a bunch of different machine learning uh, you know, techniques. First, like we apply the neural network and uh, so the deep learning stuff to, uh, build, you know, to learn the models uh, from the uh, photos. And usually what we do is apply GPUs to do the uh, training uh, to find those model, uh, you know, model first. And then we use those models as a deep, uh, deep, uh, uh, deep network learned from those the, uh, our deep learning side 
And then from there, we apply our Hadoop mappers to extract the features out of your pictures. So once you have a source, like you have this, have the dog, you know, has the labels, has a bunch of the features, then we just, you know, in, in their case, they're using the Hadoop reducers to do the classifiers. So in this case, like you have others that your, your favorite keywords you're going to type, likely we have a model for you. So that's kind of the one of the examples, like we, you know, we deal with a lot of models. Then the, to make the thing more interesting is, uh, okay, so, the, so I think we also uh, tried to encourage the uh, open source uh, uh, involvement. So recently we published our data, uh, some of our Flickr data sets for the, you know, for your research and the development of the machine learning stuff. So please go ahead, you know, give it a try and it have the 100 million uh, photos and videos there for you to try out. <coughs> then, if you then, uh, in most of, uh, at the batch side, I said, you know, many users are just lazy, do not want to provide the tech. But on the one hand, you know, once we provide the tech to the user, users tend to react to it, right? So let's say we put your, your name or your friend's name in your picture, you're going to say, you know, if that's not him, it's me, right? So then the question is, is how you leverage those? And so here what we do is uh, I leverage the, uh, a storm for the uh, real-time learning stuff. So imagine, let's think about the process, right? You upload your pictures, so they have the photo uploaders. We upload the things, we put, put it into our database, then you know, we, we, we apply those things and then say, okay, from the model we have, uh, a data trend, and then we form the pic pixels in, yeah, and we find the features, then apply the model that we have, a trend from the batch side, and then we say, here's the tag we know. Then at that point, likely you're going to say, you know, this is, a, this is a right, this is wrong. Then we wanted to take source feedback. So that's why the real-time training on the storm uh, taken in, the, uh, in place. We using those your feedback. We are going to update our models. Okay, so that's kind of the combinations of those like Hadoop, Storm, all those things for the different machine learning. Out of curiosity, how often do you update the neural net feature extractor? I'm not really sure, and I think they are at this point because the neural network models is happening in their GPU clusters, so I think the frequency is not that higher. And that's why we have the real time side, you know, helping us. And the neural net side tends to stick around for quite a long time. The, 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 the features the network itself that are extracting tend to be very generic across the board. So, oh, I see. Yeah. They don't take a long time to train. Yeah. 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 Okay, then they, I think we, in the malicious talk, you, you guys heard about the decision tree. So let me show you the example of the Yahoo version of the decision tree. So, the, so, the, uh, so, so in f some of our use case, remember I was uh, mentioning that we deal with a lot of the features and a lot of examples. In some of the use cases, it tended to happen, you say, you know, we, the number of the features are so large then we, instead of the, do the partition based, based on the training examples, we want to do the partition by the, the uh, features. That's what we do, right? So here, what we wanted to do is, uh, you know, to uh, divide out the data sets we have, and the, by the partition by the features, and have us also set out the uh, machine learning workers jointly build a model, a one single model. Traditionally, we had, we, we until just recently, we used the MPI for that, uh, for that uh, the distributed training. Then with the, when we did the, you know, our Google paper or the CMA paper for the parameter server, they thought, you know, sounds interesting. Then we say, you know, then you're looking into the CMA code, you know, yeah. That's some, you know, that's some PhD guy's code, and we better to do a better job than that. So we say, okay, we will do, we will write some uh, uh, parameter server, 
and then we want to solve using that to solve the problem we have at hand. So as a result, what's really happening here is also the machine uh, work, uh, work, uh, the le learners they leverage all the uh, parameter servers to share the information. And the, our intention here is that with the introduction of the things, we want to enable the failures of the workers, be enable the asynchronous learning, all those stuff. At the end, we, will, we have the you know, models, like a decision tree models we have. And the last thing I think we learned from this uh, exercise last a few, uh, a few weeks is that the, the details of the algorithm and the implementation matters. Right, so we had this, this algorithm running there for quite a while. Then we just, you know, in the last several weeks, some of us, we spent our time on it. We made some minor, I would say just minor enhancement of the, uh, the system side of the implementation and the, some small change of the algorithm. As a result, we get it 10 times faster. And at this point, I think it looks like our management get more greedy at this point. So it's 100 10 times is not good. It's not really good enough. They want us to work on the 100 times. So that would be kind of the, so, so as you could see, you know, there's all those things that we could work on it. So this is the example here is a decision tree. Uh, this is our internal version of the decision tree things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, that's why we're working with the open source community, right? That's why Hila Kendra has been, you know, working very closely with Manish and Evan, you know, on the decision tree resources. Okay, this one is uh, written in C++, it's native code and having it better than also uses and the operating speed of that. So I would imagine, say, you know, this maybe the lesson could apply to ML lab as well, right? You know, it, maybe it's good, it's easy to start with your basic version of the things, and then after that, you know, please continue to spend your effort on it, make it scalable, make it faster, right? Because once you do that, you know, a lot of benefits are going to come with it. So in the nutshell, I think what we believe is that all those are the big, you know, big data technology like Hadoop, Spark, uh, you know, Storm, going to be very beneficial for machine learning overall. And as I said, you know, a few times now, we are really very eager to work with the open source communities, and and you know we, uh, uh, to uh, make this thing even better. I guess I will just wrap it up. Say I want to thank you again, and then we are looking for talents. <laughs> Any questions? As everybody is eager to go home. So we, uh, so the manner of our uh, thing here, we using Hadoop cluster. We in our young cluster, we are running both the uh, 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 Spark job and uh, Hadoop job. We do not use Mesos. We using Young.